Welcome everyone. Today we have with us Josh Adamson. He's from Northrop Grumman. He has been a spacecraft thermal and design engineer for Northrop Grumman in Redondo Beach since 2008, working on the James Webb Telescope since that, that time. He received a master's degree in engineering and space systems engineering at the University of Michigan. His advisor, Thomas Zerbuchen, is now the Associate Administrator of NASA's Science Mission Directorate. And he is now part of the Mission Special uh, Systems Engineering Team for Web Flight Operations. And he's been a former student of mine from way back in Fargo, North Dakota, many, many years ago. Um, so I really appreciate the time he's taking today to speak to us all on the James Webb Telescope as we get ready for the launch, hopefully at the end of the month. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Um, this is a, uh, we are basically on track to a, December 22nd um, launch at the moment, which is actually my sister's birthday. So it be a good birthday present for her. This presentation that I got here is a kind of a derivative of something we've, that's been handed down um, through the project um, for quite a few years. We call it kind of by the numbers. There's so many different numbers that are associated with JWST um, or web that uh, both big and small, it's kind of Kind of crazy what kind of this what this program goes or what this project does, but yeah, let's just get into it then. So a little bit about me, really quick. Numbers associated with me, um, as Heidi said, I'm originally from Fargo, North Dakota. Um, she was my biology teacher way back in the day for high school. Um, I went to North Dakota State, uh, and that whole area has about a hundred thousand people thereabouts. For for graduate school or for a master's degree, I went to the Uni University of Michigan. And yeah, the uh, the current science mission directorate associate administrator um, is is my uh, is my uh, advisor from that time. And again, that town a little bit bigger than Fargo, one hundred twenty thousand in Ann Arbor. And then I got a job working for Northrop Grumman. Uh, what are you now? Space Systems, I think. We've gone through many different organizations in the past whatever fourteen years. Um, that uh, yeah, we went from hundred hundred. 100,000 added, you know, a couple more zeros. Now I'm in an area of 10 million people. And um, it takes a while to get out of town. Let's just say that. Um, there's a picture of me um, with my family. I got two boys, um, my wife, and we, um, right before, you know, as, as they were assembling the um, JWST, they had uh, picture day, and you can see the completed satellite, or essentially completed satellite behind us, kind of in that almost fully deployed state, which will I'll have show a bigger picture in a little while down the line. Um, so again, this is a uh, by the numbers presentation. So the first number we have is 13 and a half billion. And so, you know, when we give these talks kind of in, in uh, with live audiences, we'll ask, you know, what, what unit of measure, what does this represent? So since we're doing this over Zoom, I'll just tell you, it's um, light years. So, you know, we're, JWST is essentially in the successor in the astrophysics world for, to the Hubble Space Telescope. And in some ways also another one called Spitzer, which is an infrared telescope. Um, JWST is also an infrared telescope while Hubble is a visible telescope. And um, because Hubble looks at those wavelengths in the visible, it can only kind of look so far into the deep, deep, past and distance um, in the universe. And so it can, you can see in this graphic about how far, how many light years, how many billion light years away you can, you can get out of Hubble. Um, and we'll go, you know, that point, point 0.4 to point 0.5 billion um, doesn't seem like much, but I guess, you know, when you ask the astrophysics folks and um, scientists, they're ex really excited about that point 0.1 or point 0.2 that we might, we might get. Um, you can kind of see first galaxies and stars form, cosmic dark ages. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the sciencey part of it, and that's kind of all I'm going to talk about there. But because I, I'm the engineer side of things, so I only know a little bit about the science stuff. But, anyways, so that's a really, really big number to start with. And next, we'll start with a or go to a slightly smaller number, uh, one and a half million. Um, and in this case, this is kilometers. So here again, we have a comparison back to Hubble again. Um, and this is the distance um, from the Earth that our orbit is. Um, you can see the Earth on the left and the moon next to it. And then Hubble 
this is now definitely not to scale, but uh, you have Hubble that's about, what does it say, 570 kilometers. So that's like 400, 350 miles above the Earth. And, you know, over several, a couple, what is it, a couple decades, the astronauts went up and fixed it uh, four different times to upgrade it and, and uh, replace things that were, were not working anymore. But it's relatively close to Earth. And now we got the moon is next, and that's, you know, this is in kilometers. So, you know, think about um, the moon's like two, a quarter of a million miles away, 250, there are a thousand miles away thereabouts, or 384,400 kilometers away. But yeah, you know, that's the moon, you know, that's, that's the furthest that people have ever been. And here we are, uh, JWST, one and a half million kilometers away, so a million miles. And we're, we're out here in L2 um, for, uh, basically uh, reasons for the, for the telescope that we'll get into in a minute. But one of the key things about being in the L2 orbit is that we never go in and out of the Earth's um, or the Moon's uh, shadows for an eclipse. Whereas Hubble and most space tele or most satellites that you have around the Earth go in and out of eclipse, depending on what kind of orbit they're in or what season, the, season of um, the year it is. Uh, but yeah, we have a specific requirement on the whole 10 and a half, 11 year mission to never be in, in, the, in the shadow cones of either the Earth or the Moon. And the interesting thing is that once we come off the uh, Earth, once as the rocket goes up and the, um, the fairing comes off um, of the top of the nose cone of the rocket, we'll never see darkness again. We'll always be in the sun in some form or fashion from then on forever and ever. Now the next one is 6.5. So this is a lot smaller than the last two. And what this one represents is meters. And this is the last time I'll kind of rag on Hubble in a, in a comparison between um, JVST and, and us, um, or JVST and Hubble. But here you see, and you know, this is a cool infographic that you can find on NASA's Flickr page. But yeah, we're a six, six and a half meter um, diameter telescope versus Hubble's 2.4 meter telescope. So that's like seven times the collecting area thereabouts. You can see a person or average height, you know, six foot person there next to it. And from the graphic, you can see that Hubble is, you know, kind of a, a single monolithic mirror, whereas we have on our primary mirror, 18 different segments that act independently. Well, no, they don't act independently. They, they are controlled independently to um, kind of align and be calibrated such that the whole array of, of segments act as one giant mirror. And that's kind of a, an interesting feat in itself. And, and the, uh, for those of you that are aware of adaptive optics um, is something that's been done on the, on the ground, um, on ground telescopes, both small and I think very, very large. But this will be the first time that there's a segmented telescope in space. And um, unlike on the ground, where the ground there, they need the adaptive optics for the air as the air bumbles around um, to adjust for that turbulence. Um, our reasoning for, or our need for um, adjustment is a lot less. So, you know, they're doing every, you know, I think they're on the kilohertz range or sometimes I think, you know, adjusting hundreds or thousands of times per second, those mirrors on the ground. But here we're going to probably adjust ourselves, I think, two weeks or three weeks every so often, um, just as temperature gradients develop and just things get slightly out of, out of range. But as, as we have on-orbit data, and we'll see how often we actually have to do that. Um, the other thing that's kind of fun in this infographic is along the bottom there, you have two lines of the color spectrum. So you got Hubble, which now talks to or reads a little bit of the ultraviolet, whole range of visible and a little bit in the infrared. And well, Webb will be starting in the near infrared and going into the mid infrared. Um, and that's, that's there, kind of there. Uh, for those of you that know your wavelengths, we are from 0. 0.6 to 28 microns. Uh, next set of numbers, um, kind of get into the, one of the crazy things, one of the crazier things about uh, JDST. And this is the numbers 40 and 178. So for those of you who know at least anything, a little bit about JWST is, um, you might know that we're a giant transformer. And um, so let me cycle through these things. So we have 40 deployable structures, 40 things that move in some form or fashion. 
and 178 release devices, um, pins or plates or uh, just any kind of joint that's held together for the launch loads so that we you know, survive and keep, keep together and things stay, um, stay happy relative to each other uh, that need to release, you know, let go of each other so that we can go through all those 40 deployments uh, all those multiple deployment pieces. And so, yeah, you can see here on the, you know, going from left to right, you've got us packaged away inside the fairing of the rocket. And then, um, you know, it's all tight and tightly packaged. And then we are, you know, released from the launch vehicle. And then we, 30, about 30 minutes into the, into the mission, we are into the flight uh, from launch. We deploy the solar array. And um, actually from that point on, once we deploy the solar array, we no longer um, use a battery. The battery is there basically just to make it through launch and uh, in that section. So as I said before, we'll always be in the sun um, from the moment we, when that fairing comes off the rocket. So then we go through, you can see two pallet structures, uh, one in the front and one in the back. And, uh, and then we'll, that opens, those are the structures that hold the sun shield, which we'll get to in a second. And then after that, we pull the telescope about a meter and a half um, away from kind of the rest of this area here, the kind of the central core of the, the, uh, the, stru the structure. And then let's see, then you get, then we start deploying the sun shield. So um, like I said, we'll get into it a little in a little in a little while, but uh, yeah, we're, we've got five layers of this large, um, large sun shield that we start expanding. So first we got to pull out the left and the right sides. And then the next thing is to pull the layers apart. There are five layers. And then after that, we get to into the telescope itself and kind of deploying, you can see the, the, the mirrors are folded in this one and here they're unfolded there. Uh, so yeah, it's a very complicated, very complex um, deployment sequence. And if you've ever read much about JWST on online over the years, you'll inevitably find a, find you know, statements in there about, about all the deployments and things like that, but they've, they've gone through rigorous testing, um, both at component level and at the integrated observatory level um, across all sorts of conditions um, to make sure that the motors work, that everything separates, that the, the release devices release and, and so on and so forth. Um, additionally, the um, kind of one of the reasons, you know, Northrop Grumman was selected for this um, mission uh, way back in the days because of our success in past with on-orbit deployments. Um, there's a long history of, of that from um, what used to be a company called TRW, which was uh, which was purchased back in the early 2000s by by um, by NORSA. That's that's where we built this in Redondo. Uh, next two are frankly my favorite two numbers: minus 388 and 185. And if you caught what was you know the intro? I am a thermal design engineer, so we have two major zones um, of temperature on this on this uh, observatory. Um, you got the sun facing side, the hot side, which is the bottom side. That's on the order of 150, 185 degrees, depending on what side you're looking at or what part you're looking at. And then you have the sun shield, which is blocking all the sunlight and uh, all the you know uh, heat that comes from that. Uh, to the cold telescope. And so there we're on the order of minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is on the order of 40 Kelvin. So extremely cold. For those of you that um, follow your infrared or your uh, electromagnetic spectrum, infrared uh, wavelengths are essentially heat um, that all black body, that all surf, you know, all black body, all surfaces emit in some way if it's got a temperature over zero. And so we're, you know, in the near infrared as well as the mid infrared. And so, in order to, to you know, keep keep the mission going, you've got to be cold. Um, you know, if 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 the telescope itself is too warm, it would be kind of akin to going outside at night, shining a flashlight in your eyes, and trying to see the stars. Or the joke that I make here in LA is that you try and go outside in the middle of LA at night and trying to see the stars. It's just so much, uh, uh, so much light pollution, so many people everywhere. So yeah, we cool the observatory so it itself is not in the way of the images that we're trying to take 
of the sky. So backside, so here again is the 18 segments of mirrors, uh, the primary mirror, you know, light comes from long, long, deep, deep, far away, bounces off that, gets to the secondary mirror and then goes right through here, through this uh, aft optics uh, subsystem that has a couple more mirrors in there that send it finally into the science instruments themselves. Now there are three science instruments there, um, three of them, or sorry, four science instruments. Three of them are uh, near infrared, and those ones need to be on the order of 30 to 40 Kelvin, so nice and cold. But then the mid infrared instrument, um, that guy needs to be uh, extra cold because it's a different uh, range of the of the, infra, of the infrared spectrum. So he actually goes down to six Kelvin. So that's on the order of 450 degrees below zero, and that's that's done uh, by a, a special refrigerator that's on board uh, called a cryocooler. And um, down here, they say you got your sun shield again. And then down here below, you've kind of got your, your regular spacecraft stuff. You've got your computer, you've got your navigation, you've got your communications, and you've got your power generation, all the, all the kind of guts that, that make the payload, the telescope itself um, work and, and all that stuff. So yeah, the, you know, again, from the kind of the thermal design side of things for a spacecraft, at least, um, not only is it, you know, difficult to keep something cryogenic cold and, you know, continually cold, especially when you're so close to something so hot, but actually conversely um, with this one specifically, um, the, the spacecraft bus part is, was, a, was another kind of difficult challenge, thermal challenge to deal with because this large sun shield gear um, blocks um, a lot of the cooling view to space this uh, kind of a normal spacecraft would have. And, uh, and not only that, but it also kind of creates its own high temperature background um, infrared backload. So both sides have their extreme challenges um, to deal with. And again, you know, going back to the numbers, minus 388 and 150 or uh, 185, down right here in the very central core of things, as I think it's about maybe about a foot thereabouts, is a is probably the, the largest temperature gradient on the observatory, where it goes from about room temperature, a little bit cooler than that, and drops like 200 degrees. It's it's pretty fast. Um, and we use carbon composite materials um, all throughout the telescope um, itself, so that you know, for one thing, it keeps them lightweight but it also um, allows the structural engineers to tailor you know, strength and um, platform stability. And we all you know, in low coefficient of thermal expansion so that as we go through these large temperature, um, set, or not swings, but you know, changes, kind of the overall shape of the observatory doesn't change and the stresses are there. So, you know, it's very important because everything's built at room temperature, right? You know, you're not, you're not assembling this telescope at 400 degrees below zero because nothing can do that. And then, so you just make sure that everything goes together or it stays, you know, stays, stays uh, happy when it goes through its temperature range. Now, kind of with that in mind, I've got a handful of pictures here of the various stages of uh, assembly here. So this configuration here. So You've got the partially deployed observatory. This is as, as deployed as it got um, because uh, we couldn't, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but we couldn't deploy uh, all of the, you can see the mirrors, both the, the wings on the side of the primary mirror as well as the secondary mirror tripod. Um, those are all folded up. And that was basically because you need to support those things uh, properly um, in order to, to make everything work. And, What's actually happening in this picture is if you can, if you can see it, um, there are very thin, um, well, not, well, in this picture, but there are four sets of cables up at the top here that are actually holding the entire telescope part, which I think that weighs in the order of three, four or 5,000 pounds, something like that. And it's kind of counterbalanced by a weight system that's off to the side. And uh, down here in the middle, which is kind of hidden by something else here, is that telescope, or sorry, that tube that, that deploys us away from there. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of hanging there. And so from a, from a ground support equipment and um, kind of hardware safety feature, 
that this was as, as, as deployed as they wanted to make it. And you can see over here, you know, relative size. There's a nice human being that's on a, uh, a lift, just to give you an idea of how big that is. And again, six and a half meters is about 21 feet. So it's very, very, very big. Here, before the telescope was integrated with the rest of the sun shield and the, and the spacecraft bus, it went through its, um, its own uh, testing regime. Um, and one of those stops was going down to Houston to um, NASA uh, Johnson's Johnson Space Center to go through, go through a thermal vacuum test um, at extreme temperatures. Um, and NASA spent quite a bit of money repurposing this chamber um, for this test, because beforehand it was kind of a normal thermal vacuum test or a thermal vacuum chamber um, that uses liquid nitrogen and gets you down to about it's 100, 100 Kelvin, which I always forget what that is in, uh, in Fahrenheit. Um, but, you know, cold, but not as cold as, as what we needed for JWST in the telescope. So they retrofitted this, or not retrofitted, but they fitted this with a, um, with a heat of uh, the hydrogen, no, helium, helium chamber so that the walls of the chain of the walls of the chamber could get down to 25 Kelvin, I think it was, thereabouts. And so they were able to kind of simulate the extreme cold that the telescope will go through. And it was a pretty extensive um, long-term test. And um, if anyone was following it at the time, um, this happened to be the test, it took about three, four months and um, well, about halfway through, a little thing called Hurricane Harvey came through and um, made life interesting for the people that were sitting the test. And thankfully, they didn't lose power. They, they didn't run out of um, coolant or anything like that. They, they had, since it was coming, they knew it. They, they, had, the, they had the resources they needed to, to stay safe and, and alive, frankly. But uh, yeah, that was um, an adventure for them, for sure. And again, in a little red box, I've got uh, I've got some people uh, highlighted so you can get an idea of what it is. And oh, one thing that also pops out, you know, probably in the previous pictures too, is that we are a gold coated, um, gold coated mirror. All all the mirrors are gold coated, and that is um, that was chosen um, back in the day due to its um, higher reflectivity in the infrared band that we are we are interested in. And so I think the the kind of fun fact out of how much gold we used, because it's very, very thin, but it's a large surface area. So if you were to melt all the gold off and uh, put it into a, into a ball, I think it, it, it was supposed to weigh as much as a golf ball. So it's not as big as a golf ball, but at least weighs as much as a golf ball. So a few ounces. A couple other pictures, um, just kind of giving you an idea. Now in the stowed configuration, uh, back here at North of Grumman, you have again, you know, lifts and people kind of hanging out. This kind of lift is one of my favorite ones to kind of point out to people because other ones you're, you're kind of on the end of a crane, but then these ones are called diving boards, um, which you can kind of see why it's called that because it's basically a giant forklift with a plank and you've got someone that's thankfully got a harness on and they can sit on it, they can lie on it, they can, you know, do whatever so they can reach in and get stuff because that's, that's what this one is mainly used for because as you, you know, these larger ones, you can't really get in tight to some tight, tight areas. And that's what, that's what these ones are used for to kind of scoot yourself in really, really well and safely. Really quickly about deployments. Um, this was uh, when we talked about testing the various deployable features, uh, components. Um, this is one of the examples of that. So the solar array, was uh, you know is this five panel solar array, and it's all nice and folded up accordion style um, during launch, and then you know half an hour after after launch we, we deploy it, and this is kind of uh, an example of how how the testing was done. You can see that there are let's see, lines again, support cables, and then there's this essentially kind of interesting track that's above here that keeps kind of everything in line and doesn't put too much strain on the joints because when you do a deployment test like this, you always want to make it as zero G as possible. So, you know, no influence of the gravity that we have on earth. So that's why they do this sideways. And so the axle or the, you know, the hinge axis is um, uh, parallel with the, with the gravity vector. And so by then offloading, you know, whatever part you're deploying in, again, the vertical direction, you can kind of 
allow the hinges and the motor or whatever is driving the deployment to uh, to do its job without without having too much uh, difficulty to, to extra resistance, I should say, um, extra non-flight resistance to, uh, to do the deployment. Yeah, so they had this kind of neat grid pattern along the bottom. They had plenty of cameras and, um, to see how it worked out. Yeah, you can see in the end, it's nice and flat and straight up. Uh, the next one in a similar vein, this is how they did that secondary mirror support structure deployment. They tilted the whole observatory and I guess the, the telescope on its side. And then let's see, you can't really see it, but this kind of big fixture there is where the um, attachment point is. It looks like a cable that's here too. So I think it may have a couple of things. But yeah, you got three hinges, one down here, down there, and then up here at the top. And there's a motor up here that's, that does the actual driving. That's the driving part of it. Um, yeah, it's I think a 20-ish 20, 20 or so, 21 foot arm length, essentially between the secondary primary and secondary mirror. So it's a pretty big long tube that they have to do this with. So one of the kind of the fun things is when you are done with the telescope, you can, or when, when you're done with the satellite, you've got to ship it to your um, launch site. And so one night they loaded it up, they got it in the container um, and uh, put it on a truck. So in here, this is a special humidity, temperature, uh, air quality, cleanliness, controlled environment for the, for the telescope. Because obviously with something like optics and mirrors, you want to keep things as clean as possible. And so we have much more stringent um, contamination control contamination control requirements than say your average satellite that say goes up for um, TV, you know, direct TV or XM radio, whatever, communication satellites. But yeah, you know, you put it on a truck and you kind of drive it on out. Uh, so I was, I was actually, this isn't my picture, but I was here, here this night watching it go. And it was, it was fun. It was, it was uh, the first time I'd actually seen a satellite roll out the door. I've seen plenty of pictures like this myself, but it was fun to see the process. Um, what was kind of really interesting and neat is that the, you know, you've got your regular tractor trailer truck in the front here, but in the back, there was a, a special wheel, wheel assembly. I don't know what you, what you call it, but it essentially had its own steering, um, steering system. So you could navigate tighter corners than just kind of a regular trailer alone could. Yeah. So then, so this is in Redondo Beach. And then this was, I think about, they finally got it out, out and gone down the road around 1 a.m in the morning um, and, uh, and then they drove it down to um, a, the Seal Beach, um, which is down to the south of us. I don't know, it's like 20, 40 miles, something like that. But it took them, I think it was four to six hours. They had to go slow. They went on the freeway. They had a nice police escort of about, I don't know, six to eight cops going around. Yeah, and then they put it on the boat. Before we get to this part, there was a uh, there's a boat that was down there in Seal Beach that was at the port. They put it down, put it on there, and then they floated it down the uh, down the down, down the coast of the Pacific, and then brought it through the Panama Canal, and then brought it to the around, around the um, north northeast side of South America to French Guiana, and then they made it you know came in there, and here we are at the uh, kind of driving through the Guiana Space Center which is the, the launch site. So over here, this is the road that they came in on and then they're going towards, to, this area here is just kind of office buildings. And then they're going towards the you know assembly buildings or the, the processing buildings that are down the road further. But uh, this is, I thought this was a pretty cool shot because here again, you've got the, the cargo container um, that we saw in the other picture. And then over here is a full scale you know, model you know, full-scale build of a real rocket, the, the Ariane 5 rocket that we're going on. And, you know, they're not next to each other, so you can't quite get the idea of how big it is, but you know, it's a towering kind of a thing. So it's pretty, pretty neat to see. Yeah, so then next bit of stuff is now that we're in the, uh, in the processing facility, um, we were in this orientation, this sideways orientation in the, uh, in the uh, con transport container. So, you know, how do you get yourself pointed up? And we have this rollover fixture that you can see working here. You know, you get, you're attached to the bottom there and you just kind of start rolling it over and it, uh, and it then stands up straight. Yeah, so this is a, 
the, again, 99.9% um, completed observatory. There was just a little bit of um, extra work that they, they, wanted, they wanted to finish here. Uh, but this is basically this is basically what we look like right now. Um, and it's pretty cool. And I think, oh yeah, and then my last slide that I've got here is, um, again, something you can find on NASA's Flickr pages. This is our rocket. And I thought this was pretty cool to kind of show is that the Ariane 5 has, you know, a core stage and it's got um, boosters on the side. So this, this is just the core stage itself. And then up here and at the top, you got the top of the core stage. And then you've got the second stage or the upper stage of the, of the rocket. And then we'll attach right up here where this blue guy is after everything gets attached uh, where it is. And then we are, so again, like I said, we're still on, on track for the 22nd for a launch. Um, I've heard we've finished fueling. And um, yeah, so I think it's just getting ourselves attached to the rocket and getting the payload fairing and then going through all the, the normal process we've got there because we really only got you know, less than, or just over, just over two weeks, two weeks to go. So I think that basically, basically finishes all of the stuff that I've got. So I can take questions, I think, right? Thank you. Um, we do have a mic in the room, if anybody would like to pose any questions, or if you prefer to, um, Write them in the chat. We'll be happy to repeat them for you, or you can unmute, I believe, and ask them. So you talked a little bit on one of the uh, first slides about some of the difficulties of having, you know, um, the main satellite bus be on the hot side of that sun shield. Um, so that being said, why didn't, why was the bus placed on the hot side as opposed to just having the sun shield, you know, basically block the entire spacecraft? Uh, then, then you, I mean, I had never thought of that one before. That's probably the, I've been giving tours on JWST for who knows how long, um, probably close to a decade, but, uh, that's, that's probably the first time I've asked, seen asked why isn't the essential on the bottom? I assume it has to do with, if you were to do that, you would basically freeze out the rest of the bus. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, like I said, the normal, um, let me go back to that slide. Um, you know, it's, it's your normal set of, um, satellite stuff. And, you know, that always wants to just be around room temperature thereabouts, plus minus a little bit, you know, hot day, a cold day. Um, you know, um, so if you were to put the sun shield down further below you, yeah, I think you, it simply becomes you just freeze out the, the rest of the, uh, observatory and the electronics. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just it's that difference between wanting to keep something around room temperature and one, wanting to keep something around absolute zero. <laughs> cool, thank you. you have a question in the chat, so I'll read that one really quick. Um, does the web use reaction wheels? And if yes, how long do they last? Longer than the Hubble? Uh, yes, it does. So um, yeah, we have, I don't know how many Hubble has. I only have four. We have six sets of wheels. Um, we also have, you know, we also have uh, smaller thrusters for kind of course attitude adjustment for, but for in science um, or during science operations, we do do use wheels. And yeah, we have six six sets of them. Um, that's that's on the attitude control side. All I have to do as a thermal engineer is make sure that they're in the center, right temperature range. So that's where I end. <laughs> Yes, we have a question here by another student. You mentioned that there was uh, noise radiation from the heat shield. Um, how did you manage that, or did you um, just allow it and compensate for it? Yeah, oh, that's a that's a good question. So, um, yeah, there's two two. Uh, so, what we call it, you know, we all call it um, stray light. So normally with stray light, you're talking about, you know, a light source coming in and bouncing around and, and zipping around. Um, and in this case, you know, that's true because you can get, you know, real kind of real stray light, say from the sun, if it accidentally glints off the sun shield or something like that. But in our case, it's the heat of things around it that are the stray light uh, for the most part. Um, and the, uh, yeah, we've gotten the telescope cold enough that it's not, not the problem. Um, and in the sun shield as well, but 
um, there are kind of, if I remember right, two main um, components or two main uh, pieces that, that contribute the most to the stray light um, budget itself. And that is the primary mirror itself, um, which is, um, and I really the lower, the lower um, segments that are nearest the hot bus, those are the warmest ones. And so they'll dominate that term. And then secondly, the, uh, the sun shield itself um, is not quite as cold as the telescope. And so it's just a little bit warmer, but again, you know, the, um, as in any optical design, you've got baffle, baffling to, to stop stray light as best as possible. And um, in our case, you know, you probably can't see it very well, but the, the hole that's in this snout here, um, that's kind of tailored to the, um, to the, to the instruments as well, and uh, instruments. Um, you've also got um, a, a kind of a perimeter around the telescope um, that's another source of stray light. Um, where interestingly enough, the um, the stars behind us um, are a source of stray light. So if we didn't have that extra kind of perimeter, this black perimeter, we'd get um, you know light from the front and light from the back. That would be a problem. So that's how that was mitigated. And then even deeper inside, the there's two more mirrors: the tertiary mirror and then the fine steering fine steering mirror. And the fine steering mirror actually has a another mask on it so that it's just again um, if everything were perfectly aligned it would uh, it would it has the shape of the you know the hexagonal mirror as well as it's um, inside of the uh, stray light perimeter um, that's that that I was mentioning earlier too so yeah several layers um, kind of in a kind of in a normal optical um, yeah or, or normal optical design concept I guess. And then also, where did you radiate off the uh, cryo pump heat? Ah, so the um, yeah, that's one. So one of the really fun things about JDBST, uh, or and also one of the challenging things, is that we are, except for that one uh, mid infrared instrument, um, letting space cool us and suck the heat out of us. Um, and so we have large radiators on the backside. Um, that you can't really see in this picture here that are attached to all the instruments. And, um, but the, but that uh, crowd cooler, um, one that gets the thing down to six Kelvin, most of its um, components, frankly, are down here in the bus where everything's room temperature and can operate kind of at a normal, um, normal, normal set of temperatures. And so, yeah, uh, that, well, that's one of the other, you know, uh, Emergent, not emergent, but you know, new technologies that are coming in with JVST is that it's got a, I think they call it a remote, a remote crowd cooler, where oftentimes you have this crowd cooler assembly that's attached directly to your, um, your whatever you're trying to cool, say a say a focal plane array inside of an optic uh, optical assembly, but here we've got to send it further along. So uh, yeah, but all that all that heat that's generated from the compressor action and things that, that's down in the bus that has its own kind of thermal control system. So did you connect it with uh, thermal pipes? Uh, actually, so for this, we use helium gas um, and a series of basically stainless steel tubes that go up into, into a heat exchanger near the instrument that is attached again to the instrument that would actually cool it all down. So yeah, there's there's helium gas lines. I'm trying to think if if you can find much about that online or not, or if it's all you know kind of behind the wall of you know design design on the inside. All right, thanks. Another question online, really quick before somebody goes there. Can you share details of the material used for the five layer sun shield? Yeah, so um, it's actually just. Uh, so normal spacecraft um, thermal control blankets um, feature uh, materials is uh, you often use either mylar or kapton. And in this case, it's kind of a special blend of kapton um, that I guess that was needed for the probably the strength properties. But yeah, it's, it's just um, uh, coated kapton. Um, it's either coated with vapor deposit aluminum or it's coated with the... Um, with silicon, um, with silicon in into it. Um, oh, and so kind of along the lines of that, 
one of my favorite uh, things to say as a thermal and spacecraft thermal engineer is that any color you see on a spaceship or a spacecraft um, has either been chosen or at least deemed acceptable by the thermal design engineer. Because um, colors will actually tell you how heat moves in and out of, of that particular surface. And so, you know, to first order, you see three kinds of colors here. You see pink, you see black, and you see silver. And so the pink stuff you can see is all on the bottom. That's the hot side. And what the reason that and that's that's the silicon, uh, the silicon, I think, I don't think it's I'm trying to just I'm trying to under remember if it's a silicon coating or if it's actually silicon that's doped in the capped on uh, material itself. In either case, it's got a silicon um, feature to it or silicon coating to it so that, um, yeah, that, that has a favorable uh, coating to, to, to keep cool in the sun. Um, and then, but it's not quite as good as, um, as keeping heat away from the, um, from the layers or from the other layers of the sun shield. So the bottom, of the first layer and of the second layer of the sun shield are uh, covered in this silicon coating. And then the top of the second, or it's top of the first and top of the second, and the top and bottom of the third, fourth, and fifth are covered in um, the vapor deposit aluminum. And that is a, that's a, you know, very, very good reflector of, you know, anything. So infrared or visible. And so it kind of shunts all the heat that's coming up from the from the, from the bottom of the sun shield out the sides. And then, um, so it, and then also when it gets to the top, it doesn't can emit as well as efficiently to the telescope itself. Um, another, you know, another, another fun fact is that on average you get about 200 kilowatt or two, yeah, 200 kilowatts absorbed on the sun shield first layer. But by the time it gets to layer five, there's only about two watts that makes it to layer five to this to the to the telescope itself. So you got a huge order of magnitude, or many orders of magnitude loss um, of heat out the sides and away from the thing that you're trying to protect. And so if you if you read you know again read things on JWST, sometimes you'll find a, a statement that says you know the JWST Sun Shield has an SPF rating of one million, when in fact it's more on the order of a hundred thousand. But you know who's counting? So uh, one of the advantages you said about this is that the orbit keeps it out of the shadow at all times. Can you talk more about why that's such a big advantage and how the orbit achieves that goal? Yes. Uh, let's see. So let me go back to the picture. There's another, you can find all sorts of pictures about this. Um, so again, we're at Lagrange point two, which is a, um, for those of you who know your orbital mechanics, one of the positions, one of the five positions that the uh, uh, two-body um, gravitational system kind of kind of cancel each other out. Um, for those of you that you know follow, uh, you know solar um, solar observing satellites, those are L1. So that's on the that's in the that's between the Earth and the Sun. L2 is on the opposite side of L1. So we're I think I think they're symmetric. So I think L1 um, is a million a million miles towards the sun, and L2 is a million miles away from the sun. So it kind of becomes a, uh, a gravitational neutral point, um, and then we actually orbit that um, that point in space. So it's kind of a weird it's a weird thing. We're orbiting something that doesn't really exist, or you know, physically, um, like as a as a piece of mass, um, but. Uh, yeah, and our orbit is on the order of, I want to say it's a 100,000 kilometer radius. So it's a huge, huge orbit. And if I remember right, I think it, we go around that one time in, say, six months. So in one of our years, we, we do two orbits in our orbit. Um, so but going back to uh, why it's good for us, um, kind of, again, what I mentioned here, where Hubble and most other satellites go around the Earth and go in and out of shadow, when you do that, you disturb the thermal equilibrium of the system. And when you do that, especially if you do it for prolonged amounts of time or for really, really deep temperature changes, you're going to change the, the, the shape of the, of the telescope um, by just CTEs um, and uh, just the change in temperature. So, um, one of the interesting things is that we have a, 
because of the shape of the sun shield, and we have to keep the telescope in the um, in the shadow of the uh, sun shield. We have kind of a essentially a donut of available um, attitudes we can go in. You know, we I think we got a plus and minus fifty. No, yeah, fifty degree um, pitch angle and about a plus and minus five. You know, it's it's a total range of pitch of. Uh, of 50 degrees. I think we go plus five and like minus 45. And then on roll, we have about plus and minus five on either side of that. And then if we go any outside of that, then we start getting sunlight in pain, you know, starting to creep in on, our, on, the, on the volume. So um, even with that kind of small range of attitudes, just by changing that attitude, we are um, disturbing the, the, the stability of the telescope and the mirrors and the um, and the instruments on the order of, you know, millikelvin, you know, uh, tens of millikelvin. And um, that's enough to distort this already really tuned um, low CTE, low distortion structure um, to enough to, I guess, to, to require a little rephasing and, and uh, adjusting of the mirrors. Um, so that's why, you know, as we get on orbit, we'll see how well how well our models correlate to that behavior and how often we actually do need to, to rephase it. Great, thanks. A uh, quick second question. Why was this designed to detect infrared radiation specifically as opposed to the visible light that Hubble is? Right, so that goes back to this picture here. And I don't have a good graphic on it, but I've, I've seen a different graphic somewhere else. It's all about, if you're aware of um, redshifting, um, of distant universe items, um, you know, distant galaxies, different things. So the reason that Hubble can only look back three, three you know, per this graphic, 13.4 billion light years is because, and let me go to that, uh, this one. Um, the further back or the further away, um, you know, the, the more light years you have, the more red your color gets of your object. So, if you were right next to it, you know, it, and it was green, um, you know, as you get further away, it gets more and more red. It goes from yellow to red. And so basically whatever wavelength that Hubble ends at kind of limits it just by physics. And so um, by having this extra band of infrared, we're able to, um, to see those things that Hubble just can't see. But that's definitely an astrophysics question for someone. Great, thanks. We have another online question. Given um, the temperature difference from the bottom to the top of the web, would it make sense to use thermoelectric generators to create energy versus solar cells? The short answer to that is the TECs are inefficient and they actually generate their own heat um, by, by that as well. I guess it depends on which direction you're using them. But yeah, it, it comes down to not being able to generate as much heat as you as you can just from straight up solar panels. Hello. How long do you expect it to take before the James Webb Space Telescope reaches the second Lagrange point and deploys and we're able to use information that it gathers? Ah, that's a good one. Let me go back to that picture again. So um, you can find some kind of really fun videos online, but basically it takes us about 30 days to get us out to L2. Um, and then we'll do a final mid-course correction burn to get us in that final very, very large orbit. Um, however, um, we won't even be cold enough to get out uh, or to, to start using the instruments um, until about a, an ex another month after, 40, 50 days, 40, 50, 60 days afterwards. Because um, again, we're using space to slowly cool us or you know, cool us down. And uh, yeah, so about, about two months in, they'll be able to turn on the instruments and then start aligning the mirrors, getting them collected and you know, acting as one giant mirror. And then um, over the course of the next four months after that, um, they'll go throughout the entire um, calibration checkout um, phase of the mission so that by L plus six months, the plan is that um, we are fully aligned, fully calibrated so that you know, the real science will happen at that point. 
However, that said, I'm sure during that first six months as they do some of this stuff, um, they'll be, I don't know, useful. They'll be taking observations to do that, obviously, but whether how useful those are, that I don't know. And if, if they'll release those to the public or at least some version of things or not. But yeah, six months, six months down the road, they'll, they'll be, uh, we'll be ready for the real, real observing campaign. Thank you. All right. Um, so I was wondering if there is a severe enough uh, temperature gradient between the bottom and the top of the primary mirror to require that the bottom element is a different shape than the top. Yes, there totally is. And interestingly enough, let me come back to one of these pictures. Um, there are three sets, there are three kinds of mirror prescriptions here. There's an A ring, a B ring, and a C ring. So you already start out with three different prescriptions um, to, to get the mirror as is. Um, I mean, one thing I, you know, I didn't, um, we, you know, we just kind of don't have time to go into, but uh, I think you can find some information online. But each one of the, so each one of the 18 mirror, the primary mirror segments, as well as the secondary mirror, have mechanisms on the back side um, that allow us to do that that phasing, that that fine tuning. So yes, each individual mirror would should have its own its own prescription in the end. So yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, we've got one online. How did things change from the original design? Ooh, I've been on the program a long time, but not that long. Uh, well, no, actually, I, I do. Let's see. So if you were able to find, I don't even know if they were to publish them, the solar array that's in the back here, there used to be two coming out the sides. Um, the sun shield itself, the initial concepts of that you know, looking back now, we're comically simple, um, especially given the complexities of basically playing origami um, with tennis court sized pieces of paper or plastic. Um, and let's see, this little flat back here, I don't know, if, there's probably not that much detail in here, but it's, it's essentially a deployable radiator um, for one of the, or for two of the science instruments. And that didn't exist long ago. Um, the radiators, the thermal radiators for those two instruments used to be actually on the side um, of the of kind of the, the science instrument area because um, there's three on the top or there's there's radiators on the top and then there would be one on this side and one on that side. Um, but in the end, um, the thermal design couldn't handle that. There's too much um, heating from the sun shield that was that was impinging on it. And so we went through that and changed that. But outside of that, the general architecture um, has stayed the same. You know, they always knew they were going to do five layers. Um, so it was never like a four to five or a four to six discussion because that decision was made eons ago, way, way, way back. Um, I think maybe in the early, early, early um, days of the program, the mirror was bigger. I want to say it may have been eight meters instead of six and a half. But then they got real and they figured, oh, we can't really do that. Okay, I believe our time is up. Um, can we please thank Josh for his time today um, um, for speaking to us?